Hi there, welcome to Chemistry 3007, uh, Approximate Wave Functions, being delivered at the University of Western Australia. Right, uh, now I want to say a few words about molecular structure and especially the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. So let's go. Now, um, we've learned about quantum mechanics in the last series of lectures. Make sure you watch those before you look at these. Now, one thing I want to say is, embarrassingly, and it is an embarrassment, quantum mechanics does not provide any inherent notion of molecular structure. Now, as chemists, you may be shocked. You draw a benzene molecule, it has a hexagonal shape, all that kind of stuff. Well, in quantum mechanics, it doesn't. A benzene molecule doesn't have that shape. In fact, uh, all molecules in the gas phase, according to quantum mechanics, are spherical. Now, good luck finding that statement anywhere in a textbook because it's really embarrassing. Now, why do I say every molecule is spherical? Well, we, you probably have done a simple course in spectroscopy, especially uh, infrared and rotational vib uh, row vibrational spectroscopy. And you may have seen um, pictures of the rotational spectrum. It has a P, Q and R branch corresponding to selection rules delta J equals minus one, zero and plus one. Those J numbers tell you how the whole molecule, the angular momentum of the whole molecule changes when it absorbs uh, a small amount of radiation. Now we know what the shapes of those rotational wave functions look like. They are functions of the angle of rotation for these wave functions and Essentially, they look like sp and d orbitals. So here's the l equals zero, m equals zero wave function, angular momentum wave function. It's spherical. It's an s-type function. Here is an l equals one, m equals zero. It's a p-type function. But in the ground state, everything has l equals zero, m equals zero. Every molecule in its ground state has a completely spherical distribution of its atoms around the center of mass. How embarrassing is that? Of course there's a relative difference between the nuclei but that doesn't change the fact that every molecule is spherical. In fact it's worse than that. If you have one molecule in a box um, the molecule is free to translate anywhere in the box so the molecule is actually box shaped until such time as you do a measurement to find out where that molecule is. Right, so how is it that molecules have a structure? Um, there are various arguments to say whether a molecule does have a structure. Um, there is an argument by Born and Oppenheimer uh, where they did a perturbation expansion for the wave function. But essentially what we can say is we assert, we assert uh, that the molecule has structure. And how do we do that? We basically fix the nuclei in space at a particular set of points. This is highly illegal because we know in quantum mechanics, particles do not get described by points. They get described by wave functions. But we're going to do it just because we know in most cases, uh, molecules do behave as if they have a chemical structure. I mean, uh, a rigid structure in space. So we fix the geometry, the nuclear positions, and we describe them by R. So we say, okay, R, approximate time dependent function, uh, time independent function is a function of all the particles in the system. Well, now only the electrons, because the nuclei are now fixed in space at certain positions, capital R, as we saw on the previous lecture. The wave function may also be a function of applied electric fields and magnetic fields. Um, in some cases, it's not really practical to include all the atoms uh, on a pair of electrical plates that you might introduce around your gas molecule. So we just say the main thing that the wave function depends on is the electric field applied by those plates or the magnetic field applied 
by the NMR machine on your solution. So we don't take into account all the particles in the magnet or the machines which are making the electric fields and we also say that the wave function depends on those. That's also an approximation. That's also another approximation. Uh, so we have the Born-Oppenheimer approximation separating out the nuclei and we have another approximation. Maybe we can call this a kind of semi-classical approximation where yeah, let's just assume outside there's an electric field. If we want to go further, like actually take into account t oscillating electric fields, we might have to introduce photons as particles into here, but that gets difficult. We won't do that in this course. Okay, now, gas phase molecules don't have structure because they're rotating freely. What about in crystals? In crystals, uh, we have molecules in unit cells and a crystal is sort of made of Lego blocks and within each of these unit cell Lego blocks is a molecule more or less in the same position, just translated. Now, because of all these molecules being closely packed and there are bonding forces between them, the free rotation of molecules is quenched. So in crystals, on average, uh, a molecule does not have a spherical shape. It really has a molecular shape. But be careful. A molecule in a crystal is not the same as a molecule in a liquid or a molecule in a gas. We can't get rotational spectra for molecules in the crystal, not very easily. Well, you can actually if you excite them high enough, but um, most of the case they're not really rotating. So we can do experiments on all the copies of these atoms, which uh, molecules in the crystal, and get the shape of this crystal, the shape of the molecules in the crystal. Actually, this is the average shape, and what you can see is there are still some uncertainties in where some of the positions of the atoms are, especially, for example, the hydrogen atoms here on this molecule Gly L Ala, a simple peptide, one of the first molecules I did an experiment on, a neutron diffraction experiment on. This is neutron diffraction data. Uh, and we can see that the positions of the hydrogen atom are not really that well determined. That's because they're moving around and also they may have slightly different positions in different unit cells. So these are just, we can say if, if they had exactly the same positions in different unit cells, we could say that these hydrogen uh, distributions correspond to the wave functions for those nuclei. Okay, so there we have it. But you have to remember, in the end, uh, we're going to be dealing a lot with electrons in this course. In the end, chemistry is about how these nuclei move, how they break and form bonds and rearrange themselves in chemical reactions. That's where chemistry is. Uh, what we're going to talk about is how the electrons behave. We're not going to talk about the nuclei at all. So in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, drilling down a little bit more, what is it exactly? Well, we definitely fix the positions of the nuclei, but we also, uh, in practice, uh, remove the kinetic energy of the nuclei from the Hamiltonian. So this term Tn, let me go up here, back to where we were in the second lecture, Tn, we just ignore it. We set it to zero, as we should. If the nuclei are fixed in space, they don't have the kinetic energy. So this Born-Oppenheimer, the Hamiltonian, has everything except the kinetic energy term. And we solve for a fixed set of positions, h psi, h phi equals e phi. And this is the electronic wave function only. It's only a function of the electron coordinates little x and these coordinates, capital R, are fixed. What that means, of course, is that the energy of the system is a function of where we decide to put these nuclei. So E is a function of R. The energy eigenvalue in the Schrodinger equation becomes a function of the nuclear positions. So we call this E of R the potential energy surface. This is the thing which tells us the energy of point-like nuclei as we decide to put them in the system. So it describes things like bond breaking, barrier heights, and everything like that. It's really important. 
we could never get this quantity unless we asserted the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. Okay, so there we have it. Um, that's all I want to say over here. There's a few words about uh, correlation over here. Um, we see that the hydrogens are moving sort of in some kind of distribution. But we know in reality from infrared spectroscopy that and other, other things that molecules uh, generally vibrate or absorb energy in normal modes. So actually these hydrogens might be moving in and out and this framework might be stretching and bending uh, according to the frequencies, uh, the bending frequencies and stretching frequencies in there. So this picture of the nuclei shows them sort of disconnected from each other, uncorrelated. But in actual fact, these nuclei are correlated, their motions. If this one is further out, maybe this one is further in. So you get motions like this. One moving, one, one thing moving like this, or maybe a symmetric stretch like that. Those motions are correlated. That's what we call correlated motion. We know that from nuclei. But as well as that, the electron motion can be correlated. It may not be correlated uh, as simply as uh, it's as simply to understand as the vibrations of nuclei, but the motions of electrons are correlated too. Okay, see you later. Actually, I wanted to say uh, something more. So, um, to get the whole wave function in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, what we do is we make the wave function the whole time-dependent wave function, a product using separation of variables, again, of an electronic wave function, which is solved by this Born-Oppenheim equation, and a product of all the other wave functions. There's a vibrational wave function, a rotational wave function, which may not amount to much for molecules in the crystal, and a translational wave function, which amounts to nothing for molecules in the crystal because they're not translating at all. So there's a Schrodinger equation for the electronic wave function called the Born-Oppenheimer equation, and there are separate Schrodinger equations for the vibrations, for the rotations, and the translations. We won't even talk about those, but they're really important. Uh, how the nuclei move is important for chemistry. Unfortunately, that not that many people in quantum chemistry go beyond and calculate all of these quantities over here, but some people have. And when they do, and when they calculate these potential energy surfaces accurately, they can really nail the experimental numbers coming out of these calculations. It really is amazing how good some of these quantum mechanical calculations are. Now, see you later.